Hey guys, we're back to answer a few Q&A questions about the Brienne series. I'm going to ramble a bit in these responses, but I hope you still think it's interesting nonetheless. My question would be about the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. We know Bran becomes king as the three-eyed crow or as a time-traveling being. He serves as the thematic representation of God. If he becomes king, doesn't that mean that Westeros is now under control of an omnipotent deity and not free in their choices? I'm just confused how it works out thematically. Martin has works where a hive mind ends up winning and where free will does not triumph. Would A Song of Ice and Fire be one of those then? So quite a bit of this I'm going to get into in some future videos on the end of Game of Thrones and my time traveling brand series. But if we accept the show's ending events as somewhat resembling the end of the books, we have to accept that Bran is not omnipotent or omniscient. He's not God. Maybe the separate entity of time-traveling Bran is, but the Bran of our story, the one who becomes king at the end of A Game of Thrones, is not God thematically. He's just a very wise human leader who can skin change ravens. Remember, in Season 8, Episode 2, A Night of the Seven Kingdoms, Bran tells us that he doesn't know what would happen if Dragonfire hits the Night King. He knows the past, but this doesn't mean he can predict the future with 100% certainty. He knows some things, like that the Night King will come for him because that's what the Night King has done previously for previous Three-Eyed Ravens. But Bran doesn't know everything and doesn't know the future. After all, he's still looking for Drogon at story's end. That's all out of his view. He's far from omnipotent or omniscient. And as for the end of the show, we have to remember that, as idiotic as it is, it's very much focused on choice and moral code. It's definitely about existentialism. We have three big scenes all about choice and morality. First, we have the scene where Tyrion tells Jon to kill Danny. It's actually pretty dumb dialogue. In it, Jon relinquishes choice making and defers it to Danny. Then Tyrion brings up Sansa, and Jon states that the choice is Danny's. And then Tyrion somehow makes the choice John's, even though John already said it was Danny's. Again, it's dumb. John has either already made his choice that Danny is queen or has relinquished his choice making abilities, but the conversation goes on about choice illogically until it's John's choice. But dumb or not, the conversation is undeniably about choice. Then later, John is pondering whether to kill Danny and specifically asks Danny where morality comes from. She says it's from personal choice, and notably not God or external code. She claims that John knows what's good, and she knows what's good. John then wonders about moral relativism, as everyone doesn't think the same, and Danny dismisses it by claiming that other people's choices are irrelevant. Essentially, might makes right, or solipsism. And here you can see that Danny was so close to being an existentialist, but then falls short. God is dead, existence precedes essence, humans choose their own destiny and moral code, but then she lacks her Sartre humanism and instead tries to replace God with an objective moral code of herself. And for this reason, John kills her. And finally, we get the Great Council scene, which is horrible, but it's still about choice and morality. Somehow Grey Worm, who never had anything remotely close to an existential crisis in the entire show, is convinced by Tyrion to relinquish his power and allow the Lords of Westeros to choose their leader and deliver justice to Jon. In this democracy is existentialism. Westeros is choosing its leader, its moral code and justice, its destiny. Thematically, Bran's election is not about God choosing the path of Westeros, it's about Westeros choosing its own path. Of course, with the Brienne story completely cut from the show, along with the free will conversations from the Bran chapters, this comes from absolutely nowhere. I'm in conflict with your stance on determinism. You say that absolute determinism does go down to the subatomic level, which is a dangerous statement as in the quantum world, true randomness exists, at least in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Couple that with chaotic systems like the weather, e.g. Lorentz equations, which yield extremely different end states for slightly different initial conditions, and you got a completely indeterministic system. It is clear that the Copenhagen interpretation might be incomplete, but it's the interpretation most physicists stick with. Although I must agree that this isn't very influential in everyday life, we do not know how these things translate to the human brain and decision making. And it could very well be, my opinion, that the decisions of people are influenced by truly random processes. 
So I absolutely agree, and this is an interesting concept. True randomness perhaps exists in quantum mechanics, which is difficult to even conceptualize. I mean, with say a die, we perceive randomness, but in truth, if we calculated out every aspect of the die toss, the momentum, the gravity, the static electricity, whatever, that is, we uncovered the hidden variables, we could conceivably determine how the die would land. And if we recreated the conditions, the toss would happen again the same, and theoretically, if we reverse time and sent it forward again, the toss would happen again the same way. But with quantum mechanics, at least with some subatomic particles, there may be true randomness. Now yes, some argue that the variables are just hidden still, even though experiments dealing with the spin of entangled subatomic particles suggests that hidden variables are not the cause. So, assuming that these experiments are correct, this would mean that certain outcomes can never be predicted, and theoretically, if we recreated the conditions, they would happen differently, or if we reversed time and sent it forward again, the events would unfold differently. I mean, if time reversal is even a thing. In quantum mechanics, some scientists are now leaning towards time not even existing, but this gets into the theory of quantum gravity. Whatever the case, randomness on a subatomic level would eventually affect the superatomic level, and thus we would have an indeterminate universe. Now, this may or may not be related to free will, though. Just because free will and determinism are placed in opposition, and indeterminism and determinism are placed in opposition, does not mean that indeterminism equates free will. After all, our choices tend to be rather deliberate calculations. We tend not to have too many capricious whatevers that teeter one way or the other. At least not on decisions that matter and affect our lives. And even on those go-either-way decisions, brain scans have shown that decisions are actually made seconds before the conscious mind is even aware that the decisions have been made. So we may very well have no free will in an indeterminate universe. But I don't think our author was thinking about any of this. Many of these experiments have been rather recent. Do you foresee the same thing happening to other religions? Do gods like R'hllor, the Drowned God, etc. have to die as well? Well, yes, I do think that all the gods do need to die metaphorically, but thinking about them individually, that is, R'hllor, the Drowned God, the Seven-Faced God, might not be the best way to think about the gods. You have to remember that our author has already made it fairly clear that the interpretation of the gods is rather relative and human-centric. Catalan's Faith of the Seven is not the Sparrow Movement, Thoros's R'hllor is not Melisandre's R'hllor, Aaron's Drowned God is not Asha's Drowned God. On top of this, the gods get lumped together and conflated quite a bit thematically as well. For example, Stannis's Northmen and Stannis's Queensmen are all zealots looking to die or looking for a sacrifice in the Asha story. From her perspective, they're all pretty much the same thing. To Makoro, all gods besides R'hllor are just thralls of the Great Other. And even in the Brienne story, which is mostly about the Faith of the Seven, she's being executed at the location of a dead Weirwood by wavering R'hllor followers. So we have to remember that the notion of God is fluid. So I think it may be more useful to talk about the death of God in terms of God's replacement with human-based philosophy driven by various human characters. Jamie and Brienne is very much concerned with existentialism, but the Davos and Stannis story is very much concerned with deontology. That is, it's focused on duty and justice, and morality being based on action rather than consequence. The Aeron and Euron story appears to be focused on a sort of Nietzschean replacement of God with the Ubermensch, and Arya might be concerned with the chaos of nihilism. How does Jamie fall into these revelations about killing whoever whatever is pulling the strings? He's so integral to the Brienne story, it seems like he almost has to have a role in the finale. Well, this sort of depends on which puppet master we are talking about. If we are talking about Bloodraven or a time-traveling Bran, I think it's unlikely Jaime will ever make it that far north. Jaime will likely be involved in the defeat of Lady Stoneheart, though she's not much of a puppet master for anyone besides Brienne and maybe Jaime. Incidentally, I also see Jaime being involved in the death of Zolo the Fat, but Zolo is a nobody in the grand scheme of things. We can perhaps speculate that there is someone important on the Isle of Faces, but figuring out what that place is about is anyone's guess. But thematically, it's worth noting that unlike with, say, Bran or Brienne, for Jaime himself, God is already dead. Jaime was not much of a religious man, 
In the first chapter of Jamie and a Storm of Swords, Jamie specifically thinks about how he has no concern for the gods. And Jamie broke his knightly religious oath 17 years ago when he killed Ares. Since then, Jamie has been an egoist in love with himself and a woman who looks exactly like him. Jamie's big change comes with his fever dream and confronting the White Book and having his existential crisis. It's at that point that he tries to redefine his essence as Golden Hand instead of Kingslayer. Now, Jamie likely has quite a bit of adventure left in him, but as for the role of Jamie in the very ending of things, the show actually showed a pretty good end to his story that I believe is straight from our author's plan. Oh, not the fight with Euron or getting crushed by bricks, but with Brienne and the White Book. I mean, if we ignore the ink drying goof. So, in the last episode of Game of Thrones, Brienne fills in Jaime's pages with greatness. Jaime was successful. He did redefine his essence. He filled his life with great deeds, overcoming the stain of Kingslayer. He took River Run without the loss of life. He sacrificed his childhood home. He outwitted Targaryen forces. He fought for the living, and he died defending his queen. It's a life of intelligence, self-sacrifice, bravery, caring for others, and love the things that Jamie himself valued, and the things that would be great if all humans valued. It's everything that Jamie wanted out of his life, and it's fitting closure to the existential crisis of Jamie 9, A Storm of Swords. And it's completely not closure to the show's white book scene in Season 4, Episode 1. In that scene, Joffrey criticizes Jamie for being crippled and incapable of defending his monarch, whom Jamie goes on to fail to protect three times. Jamie's life is a failure by the show's measurement, but a success by the book's measurement, which is why I very much believe that Brienne's white book scene is straight out of our author's writing plan. I'm curious, Preston, do you agree with our author's beliefs as you've presented them here? I get the impression you do, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I believe about all of this either, which is why I'd like to know your thoughts. So, I did see a few comments wondering if I'm biased and I'm reading my own beliefs into our author's writing. And, I mean, I don't know, I do have a quite a bit of crossover with him with regards to philosophy and politics, but there are some important differences as well. So, yes, I'm an atheist, and I do think that we forge our own destinies, and there's probably no better way to live one's life than an existential path, but it's not like I have dog-eared philosophy books lying around. I also recognize that existentialism also logically falls apart when examined, and that free will is probably an illusion. I am also very much a realist and think that the world is rather messy. I gander our moral codes and truth are rather illogical and contradictory, and come from a slew of sources. Cultural tradition, genetic code, our rational minds, group think, subconscious and poorly understood feelings, whatever. I certainly don't think that killing God is some enormous liberating exercise for the mind, though it's probably a small step in the right direction. Related to this, I also think most people who profess adherence to religious and objective code are actually subjectively picking and choosing which codes to follow, which kind of makes them unconscious existentialists already. I mean, deep down, I'm probably a nihilist who aspires to be a humanist, utilitarian, or existentialist, and just wavers around in his beliefs, but maybe that's everyone. One big difference between my beliefs and our authors is how we view religion. Our author clearly thinks religion is special. He believes it's unique in how it inspires, he believes it's unique in how it's controlling, he believes it's unique in its philosophical influence. And I do not believe religion is special. In fact, I don't think it was particularly inspiring historically. The belief in God didn't bring about language or agriculture or transition humans from bronze to steel or bring about clean water or split the atom. I mean, it did some things. It built some buildings, started some orphanages, ended slavery in America. But I don't think it provided any necessary role for humanity historically, Sand King style. And I also don't believe it's particularly bad. It's just a cultural grouping like anything else, race, nation, ethnicity, whatever. And yes, I do believe religion's overall effect is negative, but I believe the same thing about those other cultural groupings of race, nation, and ethnicity. I kind of think the only difference between religion and the other cultural groupings is that in Western culture we tiptoe around religion and give people a pass for ridiculous practices when we wouldn't tolerate those practices with other cultural groupings. I'd also like to point out that there are some things I never gave much thought to until I read our author's work. 
The basis of the Brienne story and the idea that gender is intimately weaved into society's cycle of war is, in my opinion, pretty genius. I had viewed war as a resource issue, or a political issue, or a news media issue, or a military-industrial complex issue, but I hadn't really considered it a gender issue. If those are actually my ideas that I'm projecting on our author, then I'm a hell of a lot smarter than I think I am. So how do the others tie into this? You mentioned in a previous video that they're a male institution like the Kingsguard and the Night's Watch, but how does that connect to this video? Well, what I believe our author is essentially saying is that the entire screwed up system of Westeros is the product of religion and people believing in external code. The war, the sexism, the emotional toughness, the human sacrifices society makes, it all originally comes from religion, according to our author. And this is manifested metaphorically in The Others, a caricature of human society where men are the perfect macho men emotionally tough, great fighters, and the women, Craster's wives, are subservient homemakers and breeders. And it's important to note that at least in the show, the others were created by the children of the forest, who are essentially the old gods. So religion created the others, just as religion created the warmongering, sexist, emotionally tough, sacrificing world of the Seven Kingdoms. What I believe our author is saying is that for a new, caring, humanist society to be established, one needs to first remove religion, that is, the puppet master, maybe Blood Raven or a time-traveling Bran, then the cold and crappy, war-focused, sexist society needs to be torn down and defeated, that is, the others need to be eradicated, and then a new pluralistic society of the people needs to be established, the democratic great council. And that's all for now, thanks for sitting through my scattered thoughts. However, this isn't really the end of the discussion. After putting together this Q&A, I became motivated to do a video on the end of Game of Thrones, and some of this information may be touched on again in the Time Traveling Brand series. Anyway, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.